series that focuses on the use of opioid therapies for treatment of opioid dependence and on the safe use of opioids in treatment of chronic pain. This series is one of the many resources made available by the Prescriber's Clinical Support Opioid Clinical Support System Opioid Therapies, a program funded by the Federal Center for Substance Abuse Treatment and operated collaboratively by six other partner organizations. These are the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Medical Association, American Osteopathic Academy of Addiction Medicine, American Dental Association, and the American Society for Pain Management Nursing. Let me just go through some quick housekeeping notes before we get to today's presentation. In the upper right side of your computer screen, you'll see a control panel. In the lower portion of that panel, participants can type in a question or comment and submit it to the webinar organizers. You can do this at any time during the presentation. We will reserve about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. And if we're unable to get to all of your questions in the allotted time, our presenter has agreed to respond to them in writing. The webinar, presentation slides, and questions and answers will be posted on the PCSSO website in the near future and also on the INSA website at www.intnsa.org. And we'll repeat that at the end of the presentation. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ann M. Newman. She will address parenting and concerns of pregnant women and buprenorphine treatment. Dr. Newman is an addiction medicine postdoctoral research specialist at the University of Buffalo's Department of Family Medicine. She came to the United, United States in 2004 from her home in Germany as a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Buffalo in the Department of Psychology. Since 2006, she's been an adjunct instructor in that department. Dr. Newman earned her Ph.D. in Biobehavioral Neuroscience in 2011 from the University of Buffalo Department of Psychology. Dr. Newman is a recipient of the 2012 Young Investigator Award from the American Society of Addiction Medicine. Her presentation today focuses on a topic that has been of interest to our past webinar attendees. It's my pleasure to welcome you, Dr. Newman. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the introduction, Deb, and uh, I am getting started then. Um, greetings to everybody who is listening. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present my talk on parenting and concerns of women in buprenorphine treatment. Um, since 2007, UB's Addiction Medicine Unit has partnered with the Center for the Development of Human Services to increase child welfare workers' understanding of prescription drug abuse and medically-assisted treatment programs and to conduct research on opiate addiction and parenting and child welfare concerns. Um, UB Addiction Medicine currently develops a parenting intervention for pregnant women who receive buprenorphine treatment for opiate addiction. And um, we have the objective to integrate this um, parenting intervention as part of the support group of mothers into an office-based medication-assisted treatment program. Um, if I can say something to the moderator, I have a hard time advancing my slides. <laughs> um, we plan to study the outcomes of such an integrative treatment approach that includes medication assisted treatment of addiction, um, prenatal care, and parenting education and behavioral counseling all offered at one location. And I'm presenting some of our research and ideas that have emerged from this partnership um, between UB and um, the Center for the Development of Human Services, and um, also I'm going to present how nurses' staff can be integrated into this approach. And here you can see the outline of my talk. Um, I will outline the um, complex situation of pregnant opioid-dependent women and their parenting skills and concerns, and I will discuss clinical nursing implications and present our proposed integrative treatment approach. And I also will re um, recommend some policy changes. And, um, Dr. Newman, um, yes. sorry to interrupt. Can you just speak a little bit louder? Uh, your, sure. your, thank you. Um, 
Pregnancy is a wake-up moment and a critical time in the life of a mother with opiate addiction to seek treatment. A recent case in the New York Times is a good example of the timely relevance for investigating how to best help pregnant women with opiate addiction. Um, this is the case of Ms. Beltran, um, who was 14 weeks pregnant when at her prenatal care appointment, doctors found her urine toxicology results to be positive for Suboxone that she had been taken illegally without prescriptions um, to treat her addiction. <clears throat> because she refused to start addiction treatment, she was arrested. Um, Suboxone's um, active substance is buprenorphine, which is combined with naloxone to prevent IV use or IV misuse. Um, Suboxone is a brand name for buprenorphine and is used for treatment um, of opiate addiction and I'm going to discuss um, Suboxone a little bit more in detail later. But I wanted to focus on this example that shows how Ms. Beltram is not aware of her panting deficits in that how she might endanger her child by taking Suboxone and perhaps even other opioids illegally on and off and also unmonitored. On the other hand, um, attempting to treat addiction um, by utilizing punitive measures from the legal system is not effective in reducing addiction. Um, perhaps um, Ms. Beltran was not well educated about medication assisted treatment for opioid addiction. In this presentation, I recommend that nurses teach pregnant women about the pros and cons of buprenorphine treatment and also educate them about parenting skills. Um, although Ms. Beltram's case shows a good understanding of the family court about medication-assisted treatment, so they knew what it is and actually recommended it to her, in our experience this has not been the case many times in the past. Um, family courts have viewed urine toxicology results that are positive for Suboxone as an indicator of um, or for poorly controlled addiction and have considered the abstinence-only approach as the best treatment and indicator for well-managed addiction. However, um, um, medication assisted treatment for opioid addiction might have several benefits for pregnant women and I will discuss these throughout the presentation. Um, pregnant women with opioid addiction who arrive at a hospital for delivery or attend prenatal care appointments oftentimes have substance abusing parents and um, many times children of parents who abuse drugs are more likely to abuse drugs later in life and these women also might lack like good role models for parenting and might have experienced um, abuse and neglect during their own childhood and consequently still suffer from psychological after effects of these traumatic experiences. Um, this might make, make them vulnerable to not parent well, um, specifically because they have not experienced good parenting models themselves. Um, now they have to care for a baby who is um, most likely extraordinarily irritable because the baby might experience withdrawal symptoms following the delivery. And um, therefore, the children might be at risk for abuse and neglect as well. And so our object objective with this presentation and with the uh, integrative treatment appro approach is to break this intergenerational cycle of drug addiction, poor parenting, abuse and neglect, and other psychological and social is issues. And I'm briefly discussing the prevalence of opiate addiction during pregnancy that has been increasing. Um, Antipartum maternal opiate use increased by about 500 percent from 1.2 per 1,000 hospital, hospital births per year in 2000 to 5.6 per 1,000 hospital births per year in 2009. Um, current illicit use of any drug was 16.2 percent among pregnant women aged 15 to 17. 7.4% um, among pregnant women aged 18 to 25 and 1.9% among adolescent pregnant women in 2011. I'm not um, spending more time defining addiction because I think that the audience has a basic background. I just wanted to briefly explain the concept of addiction um, that occurs on a continuum. Um, addiction ranges from aberrant medication taking behavior such as taking more than prescribed and taking medications for other reasons than prescribed to the compulsive pattern of drug intake seen in heroin addicts. Um, this continued use affected people move along the continuum from misuse that starts with recreational use towards a full-blown addiction. So somebody with addiction is uh, somewhere along this continuum. Um, and that, that is one definition of addiction that I thought I want to introduce. Um, pregnant women with opioid addiction who come to um, 
our primary care office have to deal with issues in many areas of their lives, and I would like to describe the situation of pregnant women in more detail. Um, opioid dependence is complex because um, it consists of um, a variety of, of um, problems and concerns. Um, these include um, medical problems, child welfare concerns, and psychosocial issues. The medical category includes the lack of prenatal care, so many times um, pregnant women with opioid addiction uh, somehow do not seek med uh, prenatal care as much as they should. Um, the potential of the baby to experience neonatal abstinence syndrome is another medical concern. Um, and that is a consequence of the mother's drug use during pregnancy. Um, the mothers also have other medical concerns. They might have HIV. Um, they also could have pain. Um, I have a patient in one of our pain groups that had a medical condition of her spine due to an accident. And um, then be she became pregnant, and the baby was pushing against that injury, um, causing more pain. Um, however, because she is pregnant, the doctors will not prescribe her additional opioid medications or any opioid medications. Um, but this pain needs to be treated, and it's definitely a concern because it can exacerbate drug use in patients with addiction. Um, pregnant women might have uh, psychological problems due to trauma and abuse in their own childhood or in a current relationship, or they have the disorders such as depression and anxiety. Um, for example, um, in our um, pregnant women support group, um, women still seem to be traumatized by their own history of physical and sexual abuse and have um, emotional consequences from this. Um, pregnant women with opioid addiction might have social problems such as living in unstable relationships and having financial concerns. They can have legal problems such as drug charges and felonies um, due to possession of drugs, and they might face CPS involvement because they use drugs during pregnancy. Um, some of them might live in facilities such as the lighthouse because it's ordered by the court system, and these women have very limited freedom to get themselves any places, and usually they are being driven to our treatment facility. Um, oftentimes, these concerns are actually addressed at, uh, separately at different locations. So the primary care office offers medication assisted treatment for addiction. The counseling office treats um, the psychological issues, and community services address the social issues. However, um, pregnant women with addiction might not have the resources and the transportation to attend all of these. And so one of our proposals is to integrate this treat these different treatments and services in one location, and that is the idea of a patient-centered medical home. And I wanted to go more in detail into these concerns, and I start out with some more of the medical issues. Um, although birth defects are rare in pregnant women who abuse opioid medications, opioid use during pregnancy can result in other complicating factors. The concern is the withdrawal that women experience in between drugs they take that can harm the baby and result in preterm labor and even fetal death. And therefore, withdrawal is to be avoided during pregnancy as much as possible, um, which is why medication-assisted treatment, um, that is um, buprenorphine, for example, is recommended. Um, fetal growth restriction is a poor growth of the baby. Placental eruption means that the placenta tears of the uterus, which can result in late pregnancy, bleeding, and in the death of the mother. Um, Interuterine passage of meconium can result in respiratory problems of the baby. Um, after birth, the babies of the opioid-dependent pregnant women can develop neonatal abstinence syndrome, or also NAS. Um, this is the hyperactivity of the central nervous system as the result of the mother's drug use during pregnancy. There are usually a constellation of symptoms, such as wakefulness, irritability, tremors, hyperventilation, diarrhea, and rub marks on the skin. Alkalosis refers to a condition of reduced hydrogen ion concentration of arterial blood plasma, causing body fluid to have excess base. Um, apnea, or temporary cessation of breathing, can occur during sleep, and lacrimation is tearing, or the flow of tears. And then um, I wanted to discuss the psychosocial issues a bit more in detail. Um, patients with substance use disorders may present with additional psychological symptoms, such as depression and anxiety. That actually might be the result of the effect of the withdrawal symptoms from the drugs that they are abusing. Um, and that is hard to distinguish from a separate coexisting, coexistent psychological disorder, such as a mood disorder or a personality disorder. And these symptoms can also be associated with past childhood trauma or a combination of these um, possible scenarios. Um, childhood 
sexual abuse predicts substance use disorder, and childhood trauma is associated with the risk of, of opioid use and the likelihood of seeking buprenorphine treatment. Um, for example, 75% of African American women who reported a past childhood physical or sexual abuse engaged in heavy drug use later in life, according to Masenko. Um, women with a history of sexual abuse are also more likely to develop psychological symptoms. And we have noticed actually that many patients report a diagnosis of bipolar disorder when in fact um, they have a personality disorder which actually is commonly not treated. Um, and then we um, hear a lot about the self-medication hypothesis that women take drugs to cope with these past childhood events or treat an undiagnosed psychological disorder. And um, this ex um, explanation has not much empirical evidence. Oftentimes a childhood trauma can cause a personality disorder later in life which is associated with drug use. And so what I'm trying to say is that the interaction between childhood trauma, psychosocial symptoms, and psychological symptoms and addiction is very complex and not completely elucidated. And um, I wanted to mention um, the prevalences that I mentioned here about the Axis 1 and Axis 2 disorders are from Grant et al. in 2004. Um, these additional psychological symptoms that these women have might complicate the recovery from addiction, the woman's ability to receive prenatal care, and the ability to parent their infant who needs special care due to NAS. Um, children from substance abusing mothers are more likely to be involved with and removed by Child Protective Services, or CPS, because they are at risk for abuse and neglect. Um, one of our patients who received buprenorphine treatment at, at our office was asked by our doctors to call CPS to request preventive services before she delivers to avoid a possible CPS call at the time of delivery due to buprenorphine in her urine or her baby having symptoms of NAS. She wanted to work out, um, she wanted to work things out with CPS before the baby was born. However, she was told on the phone that none such services exist and that she cannot request services until the baby is born. Unfortunately, after her delivery, um, CPS was called. The CPS caseworker was rude, um, making her feel like she's not a good mother. She received a CPS report for abuse and neglect because she, her son had to be treated for NAS in the NICU after he was born. Um, so he received a methadone treatment. Um, she was told that this report that um, can stay on her record until the child is 25 years old. However, um, she appealed this decision and the report was removed after I, what she described a humiliating ordeal. Although this made her feel horrible about herself, um, she told me that her son encourages her to continue to stay abstinent, abstinent because he um, had to go through methadone treatment for withdrawal and he, he made it, he healed, and so she feels that she can do the same as he does. Um, but it, this shows that medication-assisted treatment is not accepted by child welfare and family courts, or they are not, child welfare and family courts are not well educated. Um, a consequence of this situation could be that the child is placed in foster care. But um, long-term foster care is associated with below average intellectual abilities in, in children and less affectionate relationships with the family compared to short-term foster care. And therefore, it might be in the best interest of the child to stay with the mother in the long term. However, these mothers um, might lack parenting skills, and I will discuss these um, parenting skills in a couple of minutes. At this point, I, I thought it might be interesting or helpful to um, show the definitions for maltreatment and abuse. Um, according to the Social Services Law, Section 412, a maltreated child includes a child under 18 years of age that is defined as a neglected child by the Family Court Act or who has had serious physical injury inflicted upon him by other than accidental means. A neglected child is defined as having an impaired physical, mental, or emotional condition or is in imminent danger of becoming impaired as a result of the failure of his parent or other person legally responsible for his care to exercise a minimum degree of care that includes missing to supply the child with adequate food, clothing, shelter, or education, and to provide proper supervision or um, abandoning the child. Um, child abuse, so that was the definition of child maltreatment, and child abuse is defined as a parent inflicting or allowing to inflict physical injury to a child by other than accidental means which causes or creates 
a substantial risk of death, a serious or protracted disfigurement, a, or protracted impairment of physical or emotional health, or protracted loss or impairment of the function of any bodily organ, or creates risk of physical injury or commits an offense against the child. And I wanted to um, talk a bit more about um, child welfare challenges. Um, as I mentioned before, pregnant women might have legal problems such as drug charges and felonies. And when mothers get uh, involved with the legal system who decides whether she can um, keep her baby, she's exposed to some challenges. Um, I tried to explain already or I hinted on the fact that family courts are familiar with the abstinence only approach to the treatment of addiction, which is not feasible in pregnant women due to complications for the baby that I already described. Um, as I will show later, um, even abstinence only treatment works only for some patients, um, but many patients actually relapse. Um, most states in the United States do not have a policy about medication-assisted treatment in the family court system, although in the case of Ms. Beltran that I mentioned in the beginning, it seemed that the courts actually encouraged medication-assisted treatment or buprenorphine treatment for her. Um, caseworkers are supposed to connect women with services, but these caseworkers are not trained in buprenorphine treatment. And um, therefore, finding buprenorphine in the urine oftentimes is equated to illegal drug use, as in um, the case that I described above. Um, however, this um, buprenorphine is only considered a treatment if it is prescribed and monitored. And so it is possible to you know, abuse buprenorphine, but um, as Ms. Beltran did, because she took it illegally without a prescription, uh, but it is a treatment for addiction if it is prescribed and monitored. Um, and um, family courts and caseworkers are not well educated about the option of medication-assisted treatment. Um, since these women come from homes with poor parenting models, um, medication-assisted treatment uh, will not improve their parenting skills. A mother might work on her recovery from addiction, um, but we think that they are capable of learning to become good parents. So although she is um, working on her addiction and she is recovering from her addiction, we don't think that this necessarily means that she cannot learn to be a good parent. But um, caretaker's drug use is one of the risk elements used to assess the likelihood of future abuse and maltreatment. Um, however, however, we think that if a mother can prove their, that her addiction is controlled by medication-assisted treatment, which will stabilize her, um, she has a good chance to be a good mother if she you know, learns the parenting skills. And I wanted to talk about the nature of the parenting deficits of these mothers. And, um, in one of our parenting support groups, um, we had a, a woman who said that um, her, her child was biting her, um, and she felt that it was appropriate to bite, her, to bite the child back. And most of the women in this group actually agreed with this woman about how to respond when a mother is bitten by the child. So they all agreed that in this case, it is appropriate to bite the child back. And this is just an example of the lack of parenting skills and the, just the lack of awareness of their own parenting deficits and also the lack of alternatives of how to deal with these situations. Um, women lack the knowledge about child development, um, so they have higher expectations of their children than the children are able to perform at their age. And this causes the mother to be frustrated, but they do not understand that the child just doesn't have the skills yet. Um, these mothers may use excessive control and punishment, and they might have an authoritarian parenting style. Um, most of the mothers view um, corporal punishment as almost the only type of discipline that is effective. And um, they need to be taught alternatives, such as using timeouts or explaining the situation to the child as much as the child is able to understand at the age. Um, in our um, parenting support group, we needed to remind our mothers to love their children. On the other hand, women with opioid addiction can also have a neglectful parenting style because they are outside of their home finding drugs. And they are inconsistent in their discipline and they lack the emotional involvement. They also have um, elevated parenting stress due to uh, the other problems in their life, such as the finances, um, they are at risk of um, neglecting or abusing their children. Um, according to um, Greif and Drexler uh, in 1993, um, common parenting problems among opioid addicted parents are erratic and unpredictable parental behavior and mood swings. The absence of, parent of parenting and the shifting of parental responsibility to other adults in the family system. Um, this might be due to the difficulty with being consistent and providing structure on a daily basis, 
or their inability to parent because of their, the deficiencies in their own upbringing, or the inability to parent because of guilt from neglecting their children in the past, or they have difficulty in dealing with their own parents who may be blocking their attempts to establish parenting relationships with their children because they want to protect their grandchildren. Um, or they're being verbally attacked by their, other, by, other, by their older children because of their own drug history, or they have a hard time raising adolescents. So for example, uh, one of our patients has a problem parenting his adolescent daughter um, because um, she blames him for his past drug use. And so that really um, doesn't give him report to parent her well. Um, here on the slide you see a study by Coyer in women who are addicted to cocaine and um, they had the desire to change certain parenting activities and these include they wanted to change the lack of consistency and structure, abandoning, abandoning children for a period of time to obtain drugs, their impatience and anger, the lack of parenting knowledge, and also most interestingly the repeating of dysfunctional parenting practices from family of origin. And it sounds like they are interested in breaking these, this intergenerational cycle that I have been talking about. We um, conducted a preliminary longitudinal study in our office um, and investigated the concerns of pregnant women in buprenorphine treatment. And we followed these women during their pregnancy and postpartum period and assessed their parenting skills and concerns. And all of them showed a medium risk of abuse on all five scales of parenting skills that we measured with the AAPI2. Um, most of them were, however, not concerned with their parenting skills. Um, this might be due to the fact that 30% actually uh, were, preg were pregnant for the first time. Um, but the other 70% might not be aware that this is an area of deficit that needs to be improved. And this differs a little bit from the study that I just showed in the previous slide where uh, cocaine addicted mothers were very aware of their deficits and wanted to change them. And we have um, more and more anecdotal evidence that there is a difference between recreational addicts who start by using marijuana in their teens and continue using cocaine um, versus medical addicts who developed an addiction from their prescription medications for a legal legitimate pain condition, for example. And so we, we, would, say, we would speculate that patients with prescription drug abuse have a somewhat stable life because they're not that far along on, in their addiction or on the addic an addiction continuum. And so they might not be aware of their deficits in parenting, whereas cocaine addicted mothers experience more broken situations in their lives. Um, so we actually enrolled 32 pregnant women in the study, and um, 14 of them reported to be concerned with their baby developing neonatal abstinence syndrome when they give birth, and 10 report, uh, reported to be concerned with the general health of their baby. Um, and um, that is interesting because um, we followed some of them and we found that um, only 30% of the babies actually experienced neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, so these women asked questions about the hospital procedures of the delivery. And so what is going to happen? What is the hospital going to do when my baby has NAS? Um, will my baby have NAS because they are on buprenorphine treatment? Um, not many women actually ex were concerned with CPS. Um, which again is probably due to the fact that they were first-time mothers or many of them were first-time mothers and they had not been confronted with CPS yet. Um, um, some were wondering though about the consequences of a urine test positive for buprenorphine or suboxone uh, when they deliver. Um, and so unfortunately in our region um, in western New York there are no standardized procedures across hospitals that we can inform our patients about. It seems to depend on who is on call that night, whether CPS is called. And I think that education by nurses in these office settings can include education about these concerns, specifically about the effects of medication-assisted treatment on the health of the baby. And in this slide you see um, the results of the neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, in 13 women um, of the study um, that we uh, followed along until delivery, only four had neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, six actually actually stayed in the NICU, but two of them stayed in the NICU because the baby was left there for observation, but these babies didn't have NAS. And um, in general, there are other reasons for why a baby would be in the NICU. For example, um, 
preterm babies will stay in the NICU and then infections due to untreated strep B infections in the mother or the development of jaundice. And I wanted to give numbers. I wanted to say that currently 12% of babies are preterm in the United States and require treatment in the NICU. And um, I wouldn't say that that's much different from the, our NAS results. Um, another study that we did um, in this um, partnership is um, by Ashrafi et al. in 2011, um, in which the brief impairment scale was used to assess global impairment of children in their relationships, school-related or work-related functioning, and self-fulfillment. Um, children of prescription opioid-abusing parents exhibited high BIS scores and therefore showed greater impairment, particularly if the parents attended any college, obtained prescription opiates through non-medical sources, administered drugs intravenously, were involved in court, or had at least one prior arrest. And um, what, I, what I would like to conclude is that families headed by drug-dependent parents are characterized by poor family management practices. They have high family conflict, low ca family cohesion, and high stress. Um, children in these families are subject to the consequences of their parents' difficulties, such as poverty, employment problems, poor living conditions, family violence, physical mental illness, trouble with the law, low educational attainment, and divorce. And so those who abuse prescription opiates place their children at an enhanced risk of global impairment, which may require services. And our objective is to break the, this intergenerational cycle of substance abuse and poor parenting. Um, there's a recent study that showed that addiction in parents is associated with um, depression in adulthood in these children. Um, and as I mentioned before, pregnant women might have substance abusing parents themselves. And there is an, an increased likelihood that their children will develop substance use disorder later in life. Um, in these families, um, good role models for parenting are missing, and abuse and neglect is more likely to occur. Um, mothers who reported the perception of their own caregivers as uncaring were more likely to develop substance abuse later in life. Um, so therefore, children of drug-dependent parents are at an elevated risk for drug abuse, uh, delinquency, and the development of other behaviors such as um, additional behavioral and emotional problems, less socially adaptive behavior, higher rates of psychiatric disorders, um, increased likelihood of illicit drug use. And um, I'd like to um, discuss the integrative treatment approach. And um, I'm starting with medication-assisted treatment that um, assists in controlling addiction of pregnant women. Um, but in addition to the treatment of addiction, as I mentioned, these women require other services. They require parenting classes, prenatal care, and other types of counseling for their psychological symptoms. And we propose um, a model that integrates parenting education into office-based treatment of addiction. Um, nurses in medication-assisted settings then can play a pivotal role in educating pregnant women about the reduced likelihood and severity of NAS among babies of pregnant women who receive buprenorphine treatment. Um, and so the concern of many women in buprenorphine treatment is, will my baby receive neonatal absence syndrome or will, have it, will, ha will my baby have NAS when I give birth? And they don't understand that um, the likelihood is actually reduced if they receive buprenorphine treatment compared to if they are trying to be abstinent, which, which is not going to work, and they are continuing opiate medications. Um, so women in buprenorphine treatment might not be aware also of the inadequacies in parenting skills, which might be explained by their less severe addiction compared to cocaine-dependent mothers, as I mentioned before. And so this highlights the critically important opportunity for specialty nurses to educate these women. Um, these nurses include um, nurses in substance abuse treatment, neonatal nurses, maternal child health nurses, and public health nurses who interact with these mothers throughout their pregnancy and the postnatal period. I have a good friend who um, does not have an addiction, but she just gave birth two weeks ago and the baby was in the NICU for a week due to an infection. And as I visited my friend and her baby, um, the mother asked the nurse that was responsible for the three babies in this room um, whether she had some parenting advice for her because my, men, my friend is a first-time mother. And the nurse told her that she does not really have any advice because every baby is different. And it is my understanding that for prenatal nurses um, or um, uh, they have to address um, parenting as part of the standard nursing practices. 
according to the American Nurses Association, National Association of Neonatal Nurses. And so I recommend that nurses be proactive in assessing parenting skills and offering parenting education and advice. Since um, we already talked about that these women are not aware of their need to learn parenting skills. Um, therefore, the nurse's task is to raise the awareness of opioid-dependent pregnant women about their parenting deficits. And this is only possible when the nurse has built a trusting and caring relationship with the parent. Then the mother might be open for advice and might not become defensive when she's being confronted with a lack of parenting skills. Um, we recommend that nurses use mot motivational enhancement strategies to identify potential, potential care needs and offer referral to services for parenting and substance abuse treatment. Um, therefore, nurses who work with the pregnant mother or the mother who just delivered play an imperative role in, um, in identifying parenting education programs or developing parenting education programs themselves. And um, I wanted to um, review the um, arguments about abstinence-based and medication-assisted treatment. In this cross-sectional study of 117 adolescent women receiving residential substance abuse treatment, 45% completed the treatment. And this is to show that more than 50% of these patients did not complete treatment. And this suggests that there are patients that need alternative treatment. And this is a study that um, we did, but um, we have not published it yet. Um, this is a study by um, Kaku et al. And, um, they uh, showed that 75% of patients remained in buprenorphine treatment, whereas none of the patients in the control group that received abstinence-only treatment did. Um, and this shows that abstinence treatment is not effective for all patients. And these are, these are studies in patients that are not pregnant. So it's interesting to look at just um, patients that do not have the problem with pregnancy, um, that um, it, uh, abstinence-only treatment is not as effective, and medication-assisted treatment is re really um, more effective. Um, for pregnant patients, abstinence treatment might not be an option at all because, as I mentioned before, they have the risk of withdrawal during detox, and withdrawal of the mother can have detrimental effects um, in the baby, as I already described. And an alternative is medication-assisted treatment, um, methadone and buprenorphine. Methadone has been the standard of care for opioid addiction in pregnant women. It is a full mu-opioid receptor agonist, and it controls cravings and prevents relapse. However, like the other opioid agonists, it's, it has a risk of um, respiratory depression. And an alternative is buprenorphine, which is a partial mu-receptor agonist, and it has a ceiling effect. This means that at certain doses, Increasing the dose will not produce greater effects. It will not produce greater pain relief, not produce greater highs or sedation. And therefore, it is safer than methadone as patients are less likely to overdose and experience respiratory depression. Um, methadone and um, buprenorphine are FDA approved to treat opioid addiction. Um, however, they are pregnancy category C, meaning that there is not sufficient research in humans to show that there is no risk to the fetus. Um, use of either during pregnancy should involve a risk to fetus be versus benefit to mother consideration and discussion between the mother and the physician whether the benefits outweigh the risk. This is a, a slide showing um, some of the treatments for neonatal abstinence syndrome, the, um, um, the ideas for non-pharmacological treatments such as reducing sensory stimulation, assisting with the transition to sleep and weight control, um, rocking, um, holding, positioning aids, promoting rest. And then there is pharmacological treatment. Um, many times NAS in um, children and babies has to be treated with methadone or morphine. Um, and there's this uh, study uh, by Jones et al. in 2010 that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, that is also called the MOTHER trial. Um, this is a study in opioid-dependent women who received uh, methadone or buprenorphine. Um, during her pregnancy, and these were 175 women at eight international sites, and the results showed that 18% um, of the methadone group and 33% of the buprenorphine group discontinued treatment. And then when the babies were born, compared to the methadone-treated mothers, buprenorphine-treated mothers required less morphine to treat NAS. They had a shorter hospital stay, and they had a shorter duration of medical treat, um, treatment. And um, this shows that buprenorphine is an alternative um, to methadone in treating opioid addiction during pregnancy. 
And here I have a slide on um, the behavioral treatment that we suggest um, in the office-based treatment of addiction, which are mother support groups that includes parenting. Um, we suggest a parent, parenting education by nurses uh, in that the nurses actually um, provide education about parenting skills and what NAS is and the likelihood of NAS, and also um, counseling um, groups that address trauma, abuse, um, depression, and pain um, that it can include, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy. And I have made a slide um, suggesting some points that nurses can teach the mothers about NAS um, due to buprenorphine treatment. So a question by the mothers would be, um, um, how likely is it that my child experiences NAS? And so the nurse could say that detox detoxification from opioids during pregnancy can have fatal effects on the fetus when the mother experiences withdrawal, um, especially if she does it alone. Um, and then continuing or relapsing to opiates during pregnancy will produce even greater NAS than buprenorphine potentially does. And uh, many babies of buprenorphine-treated mothers do not experience NAS at all. And um, the reduced likelihood of NAS in babies from buprenorphine-treated mothers can only be guaranteed if mothers abstain from drugs other than opioids. And I thought that this, would, this was really interesting um, because um, um, it is obvious to the mothers that they cannot take opioids during pregnancy, but uh, many um, mothers actually would take other drugs of abuse and reminding them that it's not just that they have to abstain from opioids, they also have to abstain from, from other drugs to help their baby ha um, not experience NAS or any other complications after delivery. And um, this, is, um, this shows the um, um, patient-centered medical home, the concept that we're having that includes integrative treatment um, that is medical, psychological, social, and legal. So I talked about um, the medical treatment of addiction, the psychological treatment of the uh, uh, other psychological symptoms such as depression and, and anxiety. I talked about um, the social um, services that can be offered for the mother such as um, transportation, help with transportation or um, help with getting her ready um, to deliver her baby um, and um, getting all the things that she needs, like diapers, for example, and preparing her for a possible CPS call. Um, so for example, a mother, um, um, when a CPS comes, they're going to look at, um, does she have everything that she needs in order to care for the baby? So making sure that the mother gets ready and has everything that uh, the care of an, an infant requires. And then also uh, legal in the sense of just advising her or giving her education about um, um, the um, CPS involvement. Um, there are actually examples of integrative treatment um, in, in certain treatment centers um, in the United States already. Um, so there are 43% of addiction treatment programs that actually provide some parenting classes, but only a few of them actually had a whole parenting curriculum. And um, I, um, this is a convenient sample of 125 addiction treatment programs in the United States. And this shows that um, more structured parenting classes might be needed. And um, I wanted to point out that um, I'm not talking about um, an extensive parenting curriculum because there are parenting curriculums out there. Uh, I'm rather talking, um, I'm talking about a six weeks or um, a four week um, um, class, for example. And I, so I noticed that um, there are parenting interventions that have been developed that, that are really long, that are several months long, and that might not be feasible for a, a mother that is pregnant. And so we suggest um, parenting education that's a little bit shorter. Um, and lastly, I wanted to talk about policy change and um, system integration, and I had some suggestion. Um, as I mentioned, um, one of our patients was interested in calling CPS before she delivers to pretty much turn herself in or to work it out with CPS um, so she can avoid all the stresses um, associated with having CPS when she delivers. And um, so we actually recommend preventive child welfare service services. Um, that is a voluntary CPS referral before CPS is um, called um, and before CPS concern arises. So the C CPS is aware of the mother and actually can help her get ready um, to deliver and help her in the process of preparing for the baby. Um, and so there are some states that already have um, policies um, associated with their 
uh, child welfare system, such as the Massachusetts Department of Children and Families, um, stated that they can screen out um, a 51A report involving a, a substance exposed newborn if the only re only reported condition is maternal use of methadone, buprenorphin, buprenorphin with naloxone, or another appropriately prescribed and used medication. And so this means that a, um, a, a report that was made by a hospital because there's a substance exposed newborn is being screened out if the mother is actually in medical treatment um, with um, or for methadone, buprenorphine, or uh, suboxone. And um, we recommend that pretty much all states will implement such a policy. Um, and we re recommend referrals to community-based preventive programs that support family preservation prior to CPS involvement. And um, if a CPS or family court involvement has already occurred, as I just mentioned, we recommend the recognition of medication-assisted addiction treatment as a viable option in, in case of, um, instead of um, abstinence only. And um, I wanted to thank um, my uh, colleagues that include um, Dr. Bondal, Dr. King, Dr. Campbell, um, Dr. Finnell, Dr. Hoey, um, Dr. Wisniewski, and um, Rachel Rizzo, um, Tracy Tirana, Leticia Erston, and Rita Sawyer, and ben Whitney Mendel. And here you can see my references for this presentation. I have two slides. And um, I think that now we have time for um, question and answers. Great. Thank you, Dr. Newman, for an excellent and informative presentation. For those of you who joined a little late after the introduction, um, Dr. Newman is an addiction medicine postdoctoral research specialist at the University of Buffalo's Department of Medicine. Uh, <clears throat> and what she was um, talking about today is some of her current research that she's been doing with this population. So we do have a bit of time for questions, and we have a number of questions that have already come in. Just want to remind you that um, participants can submit written questions by typing them in the webinar's control panel. <clears throat> so um, Dr. Newman, let me start with um, some of the questions that have come in. Many of them relate um, to um, the buprenorphine and methadone, and I'll start with one that I do believe that you answered, this came in early on, but the question was related to whether buprenorphine is um, uh, FDA approved for women who are pregnant. Um, yes, and as I mentioned, it is a category C um, um, medication, and this means that there's no human research um, done that proves its safety in pregnant women. And there are animal studies that show that there might be negative effects on the offspring of these animals. Um, however, um, buprenorphine is um, FDA approved um, to be used for opiate addiction in general. Okay. Right. I hope this answered the question. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think that was um, a number, another question that came in was whether it um, has uh, any impact in terms of, oh, um, so um, whether it has an impact on the fetus. So um, what you're saying is that animal studies have been done, but no human uh, data yet. Yes, so there are no human data that, um, um, that are sufficient um, for the FDA. And um, I wanted to point out that um, it is buprenorphine is an opioid, and um, it um, it, like any other opioid, so it has risk of um, babies developing neonatal abstinence syndrome, but the risk is much reduced compared to um, um, if the mothers were continue taking their full opioid agonists and abusing their full opioid agonists. And so they are going to spend less time in NICU and they're going to need less medical treatment if the mother receives buprenorphine treatment during their pregnancy. And there is a likelihood we have many patients whose babies are fine and they don't have NAS. However, if they, uh, and this is I think what somehow the women sometimes don't understand is that if they do not use medication assisted treatment, we don't think they're going to be effective in being abstinent during pregnancy, and so if they do not abstain from opiates during pregnancy, the likelihood of their babies to develop NAS is really high, and the NAS is going to be long, so several weeks long, six weeks, for example. 
And um, so that, that is the risk-benefit assessment that I was talking about that the physician has to discuss with the mother and the nurses need to educate the mother about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so um, another question, um, what are the requirements for being able to prescribe various opioid replacement therapy drugs? Um, and this um, person is saying in their geographical location, buprenorphine is easier to get prescribed. Uh, it's a course that a provider must take. Is that the case on the East Coast as well? So I um, think this gets to the, um, uh, the prescriber um, requirements for buprenorphine. Unfortunately, I'm, um, I'm not a medical, um, I don't have an MD and I do not exactly know how to answer this question. I know that there has to be um, a waiver of some sort, but um, I will have to get back to you. Um, perhaps I could respond to this question in, in writing. Sure. And I, um, I believe that um, we have pr um, provided other webinars that are archived that really speak to the requirements for physicians to go through that specialized training uh, in order to be um, able to uh, um, prescribe buprenorphine and um, engage in the buprenorphine office-based or clinic-based treatment. Um, um, could you talk a little bit about the, um, uh, yes, thank you, and the um, uh, respondent just came in saying data 2000 buprenorphine tra training is required uh, for a waiver. It is a federal requirement. So um, that, and there has been uh, a number of presentations that have talked about data 2000. So thank you for that response. Uh, we have people in the audience helping with these questions. Um, That's great. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about the parenting program or the parenting group? Um, so um, and I, uh, while you were presenting, I also pitched a question out to the audience to, to say if anybody knows of parenting groups that are offered in substance abuse treatment or parenting curricula to please share that with us so that we can relay that either on this webinar or through the archives. So can you talk a little bit about your um, parenting group? Um, yes, yeah, so we set up a um, parenting group that was five weeks, um, once a week, so um, it consisted of five sessions and it was a, um, a support group of mothers and um, of, of mothers that received buprenorphine treatment in our office. Um, for opiate, opiate addiction, and um, these, um, in the beginning, we asked them about whether they think that their parenting skills were affected by their own experience with their parents and how they think they might, it might have been affected, and so we, we talked a little bit about that, about making them aware of this intergenerational cycle. Um, we taught them um, um, the developmental stages, and we actually have a little book with the various Develop, um, developmental stages, and um, we had them um, take a quiz, um, asking them to um, uh, to assign certain certain tasks that, that children can do to a certain age to see how well they knew the developmental stages. And this was one way of of showing them that um, they actually have deficits or they still have to learn, so there's still a lot to learn about parenting that they didn't know, so a lot of them were very surprised about um, how they thought children could do certain things um, when in fact they were not able yet. So having them assign the ages to the various tasks that the child can do, you know, at what age can they walk, at what age can they use the bathroom, and so on, um, really helped them to become aware um, of their deficits, and that made them open to listening to this class. Um, and then we spend time in, in discussing um, actually buprenorphine treatment during pregnancy and then the effect of the, uh, on the child when the child delivers. And there was a lot of discussion also on um, how to find a good pediatrician. And um, so we let actually the mothers support each other and share their various um, experiences and what they heard about the different hospitals and also the experiences with different pediatricians. And um, we gave them advice about you know, planning ahead um, in, in, in terms of um, thinking about the various scenarios um, 
that might happen and how you would respond and you pretty much getting prepared for the delivery so then as things happen during the delivery, you know, um, there's going to be less stress. Um, but specifically, we, we educated them about the effects of buprenorphine and how it is better than just continuing drug use. Um, and then we talked about um, parenting, um, disciplining a child. And that is not necessarily uh, important for an infant because an infant does not need to be disciplined that much yet. But then later when the child is able to you know, walk around and engage with the parents more. Um, and we talked about um, positive reinforcement instead of the use of punishment and instead of using um, corp um, corporal punishment, we talked about um, um, using timeouts. So we explained what corporal punishment is and how much it should be used. And um, we actually had one mother who who we think was a really good parent and she was a very good role model saying that she doesn't really need to punish her, her child um, uh, with really punitive measures because she always tells the child how, 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 she, how much she loves the child and how beautiful the child is. So so just the idea of loving on the child um, was really important to, to give them. And then we also um, prepared them for the time of when they gave birth um, in terms of what they need for an infant, so to make sure to not shake the infant and how, what to do when the infant is screaming. So we, we gave them some guidance. Um, we had one, since this was a support group, instead of us explaining what they should be doing, we had um, examples come in. So we had um, an, uh, somewhat more experienced uh, mothers who had um, been on buprenorphine treatment for a while, and they would share their experience with what happened at delivery so the pregnant mothers could ask questions. And then um, there was one who brought um, in her baby um, that was just born, and then they would show how to change diapers. So. Um, our educational com class was somewhat, it was very broad, so we covered a, covered a lot of topics, and that only included five sessions. Wow. Um, and this may be um, related to that, but a uh, question came in about, is there a way to access the study on the 32 pregnant women and the buprenorphine treatment that you discussed in the presentation? So can you talk about the, um, uh, what manuscripts or um, studies that have been submitted or where if if there's anything published yes, yes we actually just submitted it uh, for publication um, and uh, once it's published I'm happy to um, provide the reference okay great um, the um, an, um, question came, or a comment came in that there is um, a program called the nurturing program for families with substance abuse treatment and recovery um, an evidence-based curriculum uh, that's used in a treatment program where there is a comprehensive family-based treatment model. Um, celebrating family supports addiction-free intergenerational family relationships in general and is evidence-based. So uh, great, great comment and thanks for that contribution. Um, a, a specific question came in about um, uh, from someone who says I've had um, preg had pregnant women on buprenorphine, but who lack counseling services provided to methadone programs. Um, do they experience preterm labor as dose is needed to be increased? Um, and they receive buprenorphine or methadone? Uh, I think it's um, uh, I think it's um, related to buprenorphine, if I'm interpreting this correctly. Um, I don't think I've heard of a case or read of a case, um, but that is a, question, a, a good medical question. Um, it is my impression, though, that um, as you increase the dose, you cannot increase the effect of, of buprenorphine, so it's not possible to... There, uh, there's a ceiling effect of buprenorphine, so starting a certain dose by increasing the dose, you're not going to get an increase of the side effects as, as you have with methadone or with uh, other opioids. So any side effects such as sedation that can result in respiratory depression cannot be caused by increasing the doses of buprenorphine because of the ceiling effect. And I would say that this is the same case for um, preterm labor. And the preterm labor was a consequence of the withdrawal symptom and of the, um, not of, as a, a consequence of actually taking the opioid, but as they experience withdrawal from taking opioids and then not having opioids available and so they experience withdrawal, then they're at risk for preterm labor. But if they are in continuous buprenorphine treatment, they should not be at risk for preterm labor. So there, there's no case that I ever heard of that this is happening. Mm -hmm. And if, um, and, and again, if there is a case, um, I always 
was cautious in the sense that um, um, these women also might take other drugs. Um, so in addition, so that's why I was, uh, in addition to the buprenorphine treatment, we, we have noticed in our support group that they were not as actually aware that they really should abstain from the other drugs as well, like cannabis and things like that. So I, I just not really known what the effect of these are on the mother's baby. Okay. Well, our time has gone quickly, and um, we're now at the end of our webinar. I want to thank you, Dr. Newman, for your presentation, and thank all of you for thank participating you. in this webinar. Um, you, shortly, you will receive an email from the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry that includes a link to an evaluation survey. We would ask you to take a few minutes to access it and provide your feedback on today's session. This webinar today was recorded, and it will be posted on the website of the Physician's Clinical Support System Opioid Therapies in the near future. Uh, the website is www.pcss-o.org, and the calendar of events and helpful clinical resources are also posted there as well. And you can also find this information on the INSA website at www.intnsa.org. And we hope that you will join us for upcoming PCSSO sessions. Um, we have several um, additional topics through the remainder of this year um, and through to the end of the fiscal year in um, May, June of 2014. So thank you all for attending today.